Hello, and welcome to another Banking Transform Solutions podcast. I'm your host, Jim Roos, owner and CEO of the Digital Bank Report and co-publisher of the Financial Brand. Capco recently published a survey-driven study offering insights into how banks can modernize their digital banking experiences to include the personalization consumers seem to expect and prefer. The study finds that regardless of age, over 70% of consumers rank personalization as highly important to their banking experience. The study not only delves into how to engage consumers initially, but also how to retain them going forward, building out unique and innovative digital features with a personal touch. We are joined today by Lane Martin, partner and head of U.S. Banking and Payments at Capco. He discussed the challenges firms face in putting a digital strategy in place and the path to an effective and attractive digital platform. The pandemic opened the eyes of the consumer to what is possible with digital engagement. Firms like Amazon, Netflix, Instacart, and other progressive digital-first organizations showed consumers the power of personalization and the importance of simplicity and speed. Capco recently did research finding that consumers not only want personalized experiences, but are willing to pay for innovative digital banking features that differentiate those experiences. In many cases, there isn't a necessity to build a completely new product as much as improving current solutions for a consumer expecting more from their financial institution. So Lane, in your digital banking survey, what types of business strategies can be informed by your findings? Well, excellent question, Jim, and, and thanks for having me today. I've been a fan of the podcast and uh, I'm now thrilled to be on it joining you live. So Great. the big themes that we're seeing uh, really, they really revolve around three major things. One is around monetization. So when we think about banks in general, there's always a reluctance to introduce something that's new in terms of fees, how to manage it. Is that gonna cause more attrition I'm already I'm watching my attrition heavily. Uh, resilience would be another one. So like when we think about the fact that uh, as a bank, we offer products to customers, what's going to keep them there? Uh, how are they how are they staying informed long term with respect to the products that we offer? And then ultimately differentiation, which I think is really the next level of where banks need to go long term as commoditization is always thrown around rate pressure and the interest rate environment the way it is now, you know, what are banks doing that's different from one another? And the long-term viability of some of the players in the market is really going to be driven by uh, how they can differentiate. So those are three major, major items. Um, putting some numbers to that, Jim, so monetization, what we've seen, roughly a quarter of customers are willing to pay. So, you know, that's, that's an yeah. eye-opening stat to a lot of people. Um, when we think about deploying features that actually could be monetized, a quarter of what we asked, customers literally said they'd be willing to pay. Um, so that doesn't mean that, you know, we should start charging for everything, but the survey that we set up was pushing towards features that we thought customers may want. And, you know, that's one of the big things here too, is that when we think about delivering products and services in banking, you know, we got to stop looking backwards to think about product development. We have to be looking forward where everything's moving and making sure that, you know, the features that are out there are moving towards the way that things are turning, which often means that you're not just thinking about how to best monetize a checking product or to show somebody a balance, things of that nature. Well, you know, it's, it seems like as though personalized product offerings are the key to ensuring success in not only digital banking, but really every industry. Why is the personalization of experiences so important now? And how can banks best position themselves as they migrate towards more digital adoption? So I think the personalization trend has just been catapulted by what's happening around us in banking. And that's not a new theme. Uh, I know there's, there's all the conference events that have been talking about that for years, but I think the digitization of everything around us has created that requirement for banks that participate in your most intimate data sets are slow to react and slow to provide advice. Uh, that creates frustration for customers with respect to knowing probably more about themselves than, you know, there's the wife or spouse level, and then there's your bank really. Yeah. And so when we think about the availability of data and then the availability to provision it towards things which 
coincide with using bank data, like making purchases, you know, there should be a natural correlation of analytics that can help you be better. And so we've seen, you know, a lot of firms spinning up as a result of that dynamic around the PFM space, uh, how to make financial decisions, how to provide digitized coaching. Uh, a lot of concepts like that are out in market. Uh, so I think that customers expect <clears throat> it and they also scratch their heads as to why is it so hard? I mean, they don't they don't have to go through the pain that you and I've been through through our careers of looking at the different stove pipes and, oh, well, you know, it used to be lucrative to offer, you know, commercial products as totally separate products than consumer products. And, you know, small business fits in between. And so how do we how do we sort all that out? The customer doesn't care about that complexity. And there's certainly tools on the market that can help with that. Um, so I think that that's what's pushing the drive for personalization. Yeah. And, you know, some banks are pushing the needle on creating the right infrastructure and culture to bring these products to market. And when customers hear about that and when they can see it on somebody else's app or phone, then that creates the where's my bank in this construct? Uh, why are we not there? Uh, which is accelerating this transformation across our industry. Well, I mean, you know, it's interesting, Lane. As you mentioned, the concept of personalization or one-to-one -one marketing is not a new theme. In fact, the one-to-one -one, uh, future by Don Peppers and Martha Rogers is probably, I think, two and a half or three decades old. So we've been talking about this forever. Also, all the research of the Digital Banking Report also shows that financial institutions know the importance of personalization. So there's no lack of awareness of the need for it. But there's obstacles because it's not happening. I mean, I my personal bank may notify me by name, but they show no indication of actually knowing what I currently have with them, how I use it, or who I am as a as a, a customer. So, what are the obstacles that you see as banks try to move towards more personalization and try to move from talking about it to actually doing it? Mm -hmm. Well, Jim, I'm offended that you're not impressed by a templated email with your name up front. I mean, that's uh, that's driving uh, that's driving industry right there. With oh, that, and, and, and three paragraphs of disclaimers afterwards to make sure they didn't get any. You know, it's, it's that risk avoidance mentality too. Some of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think if we look at the investments that have been made by banks over the past ten years, right? We think about the concept of data lakes and, and just the push to, to centralize all this data, capture everything, right? We're going to create the best data lake that's out there and has ever existed. Okay, well, what are you going to do with it? Like, once you once you have captured it, what is it that you're actually going to practically do with it with a customer that that's where things are falling down? Because in banking, the legacy cultures that exist between IT and the business and the practicalities of delivering product to a customer base within just an overall, you know, slower paced, you know, more bureaucratic structure for the larger players out there is an element that has constrained innovation. And, you know, when we think about making things faster and more practical, we're actually coming from a customer's perspective to deliver products and services intentionally, which means that you know, starting with research, starting with hyper segmentation around what products are most apt for the customer segment that you're targeting, because that's who you want to be as a bank. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot more prominence of that work taking place now than was. And therefore, the concept of prototyping, the concept of sprint development, the concept of involving customers in the deployment of products to the field is becoming much more commonplace within the leaders and they are pivoting the way that you know product is actually provisioned to the market meaning they're hiring people who think differently they're hiring product engineers they're committing to sprinting through a modern delivery construct and they're decomposing the huge silos between business and it forcing them to work together for lack of a better word or more encouraging them to do so and they're involving customers in the process and you know, just doing those simplistic things is actually creating, you know, incredible yield for the products that are coming out. Um, I think that we still, as an industry, face that dynamic that that I talked to earlier about, you know, the mousetrap in itself and the products that are offered from a core perspective are still very basic. And that's where, you know, we see the emergence of banking as a service and open banking coming to help kind of fill that. And how can a bank participate in new product development beyond what it does today, 
That's where things are going because if they don't, not all customers want to like default to originating a savings account at the end of the day, right? That's only so gratifying. Um, so we're really encouraging our clients to push with respect to that. If you're going to offer a savings account, you know, what are the loyalty schemes that you can bring forward in that savings account uh, to actually truly be differentiated or tie into the merchant community that you know your customer uh, is transacting with long term? Things like that, tactics like that, that are going to push the envelope around, you know, what a banking product is, uh, just generally speaking. Well, it's interesting. We've been talking a little bit recently on the podcast about having a disruptor or a um, a challenger mindset. And really what that takes into account is the fact that, number one, you can you need to use partners. You can't do it all internally and, and using partners like Capco and other organizations to try to build these fast iterations of innovation and new product services, new financial basis, new business plans overall, it's important. So building partnerships. Number two, realizing that your data doesn't have to be perfect and that almost every solution provider now knows more than ever how to use data that may not look perfect. And most importantly, trying to provide the guidance through your partnerships that can move you to the next step quickly. I mean, iteration of innovation is so important. At, at Capco, do you find that most of your relationships are built this way, that, that you're working with a lot of different organizations around the periphery, from core providers to people that specialize in specific issues within the, the digital banking world, anything from new account opening to deploying payment services, that you really kind of work with organizations to try to make it so that it's, it's the best mix of partnerships? We do, for sure. And, you know, I think the IT infrastructure is getting more reasonable to work with one another across these platforms intentionally for that to happen. Um, the the ecosystem driven approach to delivering products is is going to be, if not now, table stakes, it will be in the future. And you see it from the big box providers, the fintech community, which has emerged very strongly in this concept of I'm going to do one part of the life cycle and I'm going to do it incredibly well. And I'm going to sit it on top of a bunch of different things that you may have as a bank, but also be uh, viable, uh, you know, in a shorter time frame is really resonating with customers. And so it's important for the IT and business teams to actually decompose, you know, when they look at how they interact with customers, what are those logical assets that are there that can be used you know, to manage the process more holistically, but also to draw upon unique strengths and vulnerabilities of what exists in, in the current spot for that place. So if we're thinking about account origination, for instance, right? Speed and origination, safety and origination, capturing that data for applicability for cross-channel usage, but also for effectiveness for dealing with a customer, you know, is part of the intentional design here. Uh, what we don't want to do is set up and modernize things that are just so so driven to be precisely something that therefore you create a reliance on staying that way for a long time, right? So the intentionality of the design across the life cycle is really important. And, and we find that, you know, customers that are relying on old big box technology to, you know, keep up with all of the different upgrades that can happen over time, uh, that they're they're quickly falling behind, they're realizing it, and they're looking for alternatives. So sometimes this is about an iteration of a current product or, or even innovation of a new product. So beyond simply personalizing experiences, we are also discussing more and more about development of new products and services, both internally and through open banking relationships. What are some of the primary challenges that you believe banks have to consider as they expand their product offerings and overall their digital brand? Well, so one, I think, is just committing to a product development methodology that's inclusive of a broad set of partners. So, you know, when we think about that whole dynamic around being able to manage your own existing IT assets and to make them better over time, just to what we were discussing, there's going to be a point in time which you're going to want to rely on a partner to plug into this, to bring in an asset, right? <clears throat> so how do you develop basically that modern delivery cadence where you can bring a vendor in and say, this is how we develop product and have them intersect with the time it takes 
to do sprint development, to deploy new features and have them tested by users in a period of time that, that can actually be understandable by the partner and also deployable by the bank's IT staff and business staff. I think that that's one of the biggest things here. And some of the leaders, you know, that we've had the privilege of working with are, are really creating that, that sort of mechanism that's easily understood. It works across IT and business. You've got a backlog of features. You've got ecosystem partners that fit into that backlog. You've got a timeline that's taking place to actually modernize functions. And so that everybody can work, you know, in an, in a context where it's being controlled by the air traffic controller, but actually be developed in a way where you can show your executive team the progress of the feature set you've deployed over time. And so I think when we think about it, Jim, getting that right, getting how do I create that mousetrap to actually provision products and services quickly um, and on a repeatable base is, is a huge accelerator in the market. Well, well, it's interesting because really what you're talking about is you're working with organizations that have really embraced the thought that they've got to change. They got to embrace a brand new way of doing business because, you know, I, heck, I've been in banking 40 years and for a good part of those years in the banking world, we didn't have to worry about that much innovation. And if we did innovation, it was like introducing something brand new, big, that took years to develop. Well, we proved with PPP loans that we don't have to, we, we can work at the speed of, of digital and that we can develop things really quickly. But, you know, what's interesting is beyond simply de developing brand new products, you mentioned the ability to develop features and benefits that customers are even willing to pay for. So what are some of the digital banking features that your research found that customers would pay for? Yeah. So some of the top ones, Jim, the first would be just personalized training. So meaning I behave like this with my bank. I spend this much money on these sort of things. What does someone like me spend on these things? And how am I doing comparative to my peers? And what should I be doing differently? You know, how, how should I view using a credit card in a practical sense with respect to a debit card? Some of these just basic concepts are now very trainable in order to offset fees that are being paid by customers and they realize it. So help me how to be, help train me to be smarter with respect to my financial matters is the number one thing that popped and well, across our research, which is interesting because, you know, they will pay for that. Right. Right now, banks aren't thinking that I should be committed to, you know, developing a learning based platform to help uh, clients, uh, you know, be well informed, but also be paid for doing so. It's always let's just have them be well informed because we're good corporate citizens. Uh, but the uh, the other dynamic around subscription based pricing, the other IT and service providers that you work with in your life are charging for those things. And it's what's driving the innovation in those segments, right? So it's, this is a, this is a, a, you can call it a chicken and an egg, but our research is actually saying, let's not debate it. Let's just go do it. Let's just go take a stand and make a push for it and have, have the revenue offset the development efforts intentionally. Uh, so I said, training is one alerts, right? So just simple alert functionality. I'm about to incur a, a charge. My balance dropped to this level and it's, you know, under these thresholds, you know, some of these things are very basic uh, and customers want them, which shows you that the unified digital experience across our industry just isn't there yet with some of these table stakes features. Some of these features exist, but the onboarding process for customers is so clunky that they don't know that those features exist and that they can get that anyway out of their, out of their uh, providers. And then the third would be stop limits. So like, Let's let's make sure that we don't hit the red. Uh, stop my transaction before it happens, so I don't incur a fee. Uh, things like that. Well, it's interesting because this is really a change in thinking. Because, gosh, financial institutions just love to give away things for free, and yet, you know, we found, geez, it's probably almost not quite a decade, but quite a while ago, that Regions Bank and U.S. Bank, with regard to their mobile check deposit capture, realized, you know, we can scale this. We can say, if you want your money immediately, it's going to cost you $3. I'm just picking a number. I don't exactly remember what the, the dynamics were. If you want it in, in two days, it'll only cost you $2. But if you wait three days, it'll be free. 
in much the same way that you have the decision whether to go to the ATM from an, another financial institution to get your money from your bank, or you can go a little bit further and get it from your bank. And consumers are used to paying the value proposition and accordingly. So really, when we find out about the ways to do this, there's a lot of lost revenue opportunities. And this is going to be important when you get to open banking, too, because if you build relationships and services outside your internal um, ecosystem, you have the ability to, ch to actually charge consumers for some of these benefits, as you've mentioned. So it'll be interesting to see where we go, because, again, the legacy bank mentality is I don't want to charge for anything because your competitors may do it for free. And I, I don't hear of any examples where U.S. Bank or a Regions Bank lost customers because of their value prices. So, no, Absolutely. And, and another dynamic in that is just transparency and making yeah, it a transparent exactly. process through the UI so that customers realize that what they're getting indeed is a benefit with respect to accelerated access to funds. Uh, so therefore, if you're transparent about your pricing, uh, that is required to provision that service, then it's an exchange of value here. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of times it's it's just that approach to actually being transparent about your your fee structure and why there would be a fee for this. You know, we worked with one bank that was incredibly focused on the language that they used to be as simplistic as possible with respect to understanding fees. Like we're not going to shy away from fees because given our interest rate environment, we need them to provide you know, the, the modern and innovative features that our customers are seeking. But we're going to do it in a way there's absolute transparency all the time. And, yep. and we're going to do it in their language, right? So, so there's a push for that. Uh, the interest rate environment is very different right now than it has been you know, for decades for banks. And at the same time, the banks are facing this modernization edict that's out there, right? You will modernize if you're going to keep your customers. I mean, some of the some of the data back to the survey, 53% uh, of, of millennials and 42% of Gen Z uh, have switched banks in the past two years. I mean, that's staggering. And, yeah. you know, do we know if it's full-fledged switch or if it's origination from the switch and what a millennial considers their bank to be a switch, whether that's a DDA you know, direct deposit change, or whether that's the fact that they opened a Chime account for the mobile app, you know, that's that's to be explored further. But, you know, just that all of the banks that have invested in the five minute account opening are getting new customers, right? As long as there's a value prop that coincides with that, like interest. Well, um, on that on that subject of switching, we found in research that we've done that while consumers may not be actually closing existing banking relationships, they're definitely expanding the number of providers and types of providers they're using, impacting loyalty. Do you believe that there's a bigger threat from consumers switching banks or simply from consumers that are fragmenting the relationships and making it so while the account maybe didn't close, this consumer has five new relationships that they didn't have before. I mean, I you talked about the millennials and I look at my son, I go, if you don't you really peel back the layers on what his primary financial institution is right now, it's probably Venmo because he has a Venmo debit card. He has a relationship with Venmo. Yes, he still has his legacy banking relationship, but that's simply a transfer. It's not where he, is, he holds his deposits here, but now he's starting to hold his deposit at Venmo as well. Do you think there's a bigger concern about consumers fragmenting or switching or both? So, I, well, I think fragmentation is a, a bigger concern in the near term because it's it's removing the asset base from your typical accounts to justify their cost because it's easier to frag it's easier to onboard a person into a high yield savings bank in 5 minutes that's going to get much more personally rewarded from moving their larger asset base there while you as the entity that provisions all the infrastructure for their transaction accounts and are not uh, taking taking as much advantage of the larger wallet share as a result of that other neo bank that took your high yield savings customer assets. Um, the fragmentation's there, and you know. So I think that right now what we're finding is that the neo banks, you know, are starting with starting with kind of that hook to actually pull customers over for a very particular reason. If you look at like Brex or you look at the pure point financials of the world or even Marcus products that are out there. You know, they're starting intentionally with a product and then they're building out 
okay, now how can I command more wallet share from that? And what they have as an asset in these times goes back to our conversation about the fintech ecosystem. It's that if they want to onboard and offer bill pay, if they want to onboard and offer uh, access, access to a real-time payments uh, network, there's a select set of fintech providers that can provide that quickly, um, which will allow them to have more wallet share long term. And so I do think that that fragmentation is, is happening to a large degree, but I also think that it's going to ultimately lead to full term wallet share for these customers because, you know, every one of these fintechs that we're talking about is starting small. They're expanding to actually get more of that wallet share and even looking beyond banking. A lot of them look to wealth, wealth management. Um, you know, and go up market with respect to the customer base, but are planning the flag to say, come try me. I'm differentiated. The UI experience is going to be better than what your bank offers. Look at how we use your data. Look at how we make it simple for you. And once you're there, they're going to push to turn the dial to create more of a more of a yield for your relationship. Well, it's interesting. Your research, which, by the way, is excellent on what you did, We've talked about the need for personalization. We talked about the the need for um, actually monetizing the aspects. We talked about switching. But another part of your research also talked about the importance of finding ways to humanize the digital experience, where actually beyond simply making it easier for the consumer, in some cases, the consumer still wants some level of humanization, be it chatbots or be it texting or be it uh, through some type of interaction, facial or, or, or verbal communication. Can you talk a little bit about what your research did find about how important this was to the overall relationship? Oh, absolutely. And, and I think it's, it's interesting to kind of look at this from you know, the private banking realm down to the digital banking realm as being a, a continuum. So when we think about assets growing over time and the customers that fit within the asset bases based off how they're segmented, you're gonna see a desire for more hands-on support the higher the asset bases. Uh, so the research shows that, you know, people want people involved in their banking. They, they don't want to necessarily just rely upon training an algorithm. And, you know, as fast and inaccurate as an algorithm could be in early stages will lead to people just deflecting from it and then calling a call center with more heat behind what they've said because they've tried your technology out and it didn't work, right? And so I think we're finding that our customers that are rolling out these trials with respect to the servicing encounter are, are being very uh, intentional around the product set to which those align. Uh, if, if it's a larger, more sophisticated product that's out there, they're gonna want the white glove treatment and support and to not have to do self-service to actually move that, that product forward. Um, and so the research will show that while private banking is somewhat of the echelon for provisioning these products and services, uh, that some of the digital tactics just aren't there yet to actually fall into that. Well, it's interesting too. When you look, you, you talk about the the need to iterate over time and, and that the the knowledge only gets better with time. You, you look at the what is now, I believe, over a two-year lead that Bank of America has with their voice banking with Erica. And it's interesting because they keep on expanding the services. They keep on expanding the capabilities. And it's all built on previous histories and, and integrations. And what is interesting is, this could be with chatbots. It could be with humans actually following up on an onboarding solution. But really, we have to think beyond simply making it easier. Because the problem is most financial institutions will, will keep on looking for efficiency before they're going to be looking at effectiveness. I mean, I, I look at the way we used to sell the, the need for ATMs or, or online banking and then digital banking. And it was all about we can save money. Well, that wasn't really putting the consumer first as much as we positioned it as such. But really, when you're talking about the humanization, and as you mentioned in the research about these different ways to humanize experience, even a chatbot is a humanized way and texting is humanized. This is going to be an important next level of digitalization, isn't it? Absolutely, it will be. And I mean, you can definitely, you can tell those who, who win the service awards by providing some solutions to support the customer as an individual, uh, the way that they want to live and transact with the bank. So, 
you know, having having done a refi as well as many other million people last year with respect to the rates, you know, the fact that I could have a text relationship with the person on the other end of it, regardless of where I was within their digital banking application and knew that when I sent in a text to the person, I wasn't starting over. We were just continuing the dialogue yeah. that had huge benefit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could take that company and compare it to a much larger bank and what they offer with respect to their CRM. And, you know, the feature of, of having somebody correspond on a text message for me was incredibly valuable versus, you know, the bigger bank that has the more sophisticated approach that doesn't tie into that customer's desire for where they are in life is missing, it's missing the mark. So they're investing in a bunch of infrastructure that actually isn't gonna result in their loan closing, as opposed to thinking through, what's the quickest way that I could actually align uh, connectivity to this customer in a way that makes sense for them? And use journeys. You know, you talk a lot on your podcast around the importance of journeys. You know, the yeah. customer's experience through origination and servicing events, you know, all of that can be modeled out to find what's the lowest common denominator with respect to assets that we should deploy and how quickly should we deploy them uh, in order to improve the experience. So providing, you know, text service is one simple way uh, to, to increase, you know, the applicability of some products that are offered well, without having to overinvest in that case. Well, it's interesting. Your research report, 23 pages and all, really focus on where to invest to modernize digital banking. And a question I often get, and, and it's, I usually know what the answer is going to be, but the, it's an important dynamic, is given the scope of what needs to be done and what can be done, is personalization and customization of digital banking only possible for the largest financial institutions? Or can many of these initiatives be implemented by financial institutions of any size or even small organizations? Absolutely, they can be. And so that it isn't just for the big players alone. And that's where, you know, we're helping de novo institutions stand themselves up from the start on the latest technology infrastructure that exists throughout what these fintechs offer. And that gives them a leg up to be able to start anew. And if your institution is small mm -hmm. enough that you should be considering that strategy anyway, and then converting your existing small customer base onto a net new platform to say, you know, today, welcome to the new bank, right? And, and here it is. A lot of people fear that, that everything's going to fall apart when you do that. Some institutions are small enough that that's a calculated risk worth taking. The cost of IT infrastructure, you know, and what's available today versus, you know, the days gone by is just a staggering back to your concept around business case. It's a quick business case to make. Um, and the commoditization of the product set and the customers, and even what we're seeing in the acquisition realm where, you know, smaller banks are having to decide digitize or die, um, you know, that plays into it. There's a path to digitization where you can own your future and that you have to invest in it. Or there's a path to actually concede and move over to, you know, another FI to work more in a in a way where you're you're letting them take advantage of the infrastructure that they have, and you uh, you migrate your customer base to them. We're seeing both of those paths uh, very heavily in the market, uh, and uh, and I think it's just one of those dynamics around the digitization realm that's happening in our industry. And you know, the cost of digitization is hard for our clients because it's not just creating apps, products, it's creating compliant apps <laughs> and products. Yeah. Uh, and, and how do you weave in uh, compliance within something that moves so quickly, right? Legacy clients need to be trained on how to do that. Um, yeah. And it's not, it's not that simple, so. Well, and, and, and you know, when you talk about scaling, that's where partnerships come in. You, you have the ability to work with a partner to say, how do I prioritize my investments? Where do I start? Where do I get the biggest return with the lowest level investment to get more investment dedicated going forward? And this is available to all organizations. And I, you know, really what we're talking about is building better experiences, not just going digital, but doing it in a way that actually improves the experience to the degree where a consumer is gonna want to access your app, work with you more frequently and actually use you as the hub of a financial relationship as opposed to a spoke. So, so Lane, finally, how do listeners get a copy of this very interesting research that you've done at Capco? 
So they can go ahead and send an email to uh, Melody Calloway, which is uh, melody.calloway at capco.com. And she maintains our research uh, inventory and we can get you a copy. And also there's gonna be, if you visit capco.com, our research is posted. Uh, so you can go there to retrieve it two different ways. And actually, I think what we're going to end up doing is I think we're going to actually have a link as part of the podcast notes. So however you access this um, podcast, I believe we're going to also have a link to it. So I, I just I really encourage our listeners to get a copy of this research, because as we're getting into planning session and even beyond the planning season, you know, it's more important than ever to get a, a grip on what is possible what the marketplace is saying, because this is consumer research, not of other institutions, but of actually consumers saying, here's what we want. And it's certainly going to help you prioritize. Lane, really appreciate you being on the show today. Um, Would love to have you back sometime in the future. Yeah, great being with you, Jim. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Banking Transform Solutions podcast. A new banking podcast that focuses on innovative solutions for financial institutions. We'd like to thank Capco, the sponsor of today's show. If you're a solution provider wanting to discuss how you can help bankers and credit unions executives solve a major marketplace challenge, drop me an email. We're keen to help. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Longbreak, audio engineer, Sean Roll Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Maroos. Until next time, remember, consumers want you to know them, understand them, and reward them on a personalized basis every day with each interaction.